Hello, everyone. Welcome to CLMP 3721. I'm Li Wen Hanxie, and I'll give you a brief introduction of what we are going to learn for the first part of the lecture. Patient suggests the purpose of this course is to introduce the fundamental ideas, models, and results that permeate computer science, as well as the basic paradigms of the film. It is basically a mathematical study of computing machines, their fundamental capabilities and limits. Particularly, it aims to address two fundamental questions from the mathematical perspective. What problems are solvable in principle and practice, respectively? In other words, what can and cannot be computed at all, and what can and cannot be computed efficiently? Second, what is an algorithm? How can we define algorithms formally in order to characterize problems as solvable or unsolvable? So at the end of this lecture, we'll define an algorithm is a Turing machine that always holds. Now, let me elaborate these two questions. Let's say we put all the problems in the circle. It can be divided into computationally solvable problems and unsolvable problems. Note that there is the computability theory for this classification problem. And we further look into the back of solvable problems. Since they are solvable computationally, there must exist corresponding algorithms. However, different algorithms have various levels of complexity. Such complexity is mostly determined by the problem itself. People are interested in the efficiency to compute the solutions by means of computers. So we have this P problem, which can be solved in polynomial time. For instance, when we deploy a single neural network, the time cost is linear. And there are MP problems, which are solvable in polynomial time by a non-deterministic Turing machine, together with MPC problems whose solutions can be verified in polynomial time. To study the solvability of problems, we need to define algorithms in mathematics as the first step. Therefore, the first part of the lecture is mostly concerned with the second question, a formal definition of algorithms. We might already have the idea that an algorithm is a finite set of instructions to achieve some goals or finish certain tasks. And we know that in computational practice, these instructions are implemented and encoded in the computer's memory as strings or bits or other symbols appropriate for manipulation by a computer. Therefore, practitioners of computational theory are naturally driven to propose models of computation that are capable of performing string manipulation tasks. Part one introduced two of the simplest computation models, finite automata and pushdown automata. With different features, they show different level of ability to recognize strings and their restrictions. And they lead to our further discussion of more sophisticated computational machines later. As a basis of the course, we review the basic concepts of sets, relations, and functions, and we formally introduce languages and theories on countability. Sets have operations including intersection, union, difference, and condition product. Here, the power set is basically the set of all possible subsets, and therefore, it has an order of two powers n. n is the order of the original set and the notion of partition is given. This leads to the definition of relations and functions, especially bijections and equivalence relation. We call a set of string under certain restrictions a language. A string is actually a finite sequence of symbols, and we call the set of all possible symbols an alphabet. An alphabet is finite always. For the sequential nature, a string, or say a word, has operations like concatenation, reversal, power, which means n copies. It's shown here. And correspondingly, languages have similar operations, including concatenation, reversal, and power. And there is clean star and plus. Clean star is a highlighted operation that you might not know before. You can look at the definition here. So far, you may wonder why we care about strings or say languages and develop corresponding computational machines. This is because languages and computational machines are intrinsically connected. Consider a simple decision problem which outputs of either yes or no. 
like one asks whether a given number even. It can be transformed to an equivalent language recognition problem, where we first find a way to encode each possible input as a string and find out whether the given string belongs to the language where all instances correspond to the yes answer. And as mentioned before, in reality, programs of solving problems are encoded into strings for further manipulations by a computer. So the classical theory of computation traditionally deals with processing an input string of symbols into an output string of symbols. This process can be regarded as a string recognition problem. Due to the limited memory of machines, the representation of languages by finite specifications is a central issue in the theory of computation, typically when infinite languages are considered. Here, we have an important result claiming that it is impossible to finitely represent all languages over any non-empty finite alphabet. And so there are always languages that cannot be computed by a computational model. The claim comes from the countability arguments, especially the diagonalization principle. For a fixed alphabet, it can produce countably infinite finite representations. However, the set of all possible languages over the alphabet is its superset, which is uncountable. We cannot build up a bijection from the finite representations to the languages, and hence there must be some languages unable to be represented finitely. Recall our previous example of a decision problem, which can be transformed into a language recognition problem. Now that not all language can be represented, we may further deduce that there must exist unsolvable problems. With the background, we will finally learn about two types of basic computation models, deterministic finite automata or non-deterministic finite automata, as well as pushdown automata and they relate to regular language and context-free language, respectively. The regular language refers to a language that can be specified as a regular exp expression. The components of a regular expression are quite simple. Only the original normal alphabets, plus, brackets, clean star, empty string, and union symbol. Each empowers the expression for complex string patterns. For example, all strings that look like 010101, where 01 repeat for a constant time, can be denoted as left bracket, 01, right bracket, and clean star. An example of deterministic finite automata are vending machines. For different configurations of coins sending to the machine, it can automatically decide whether to sell the items and the correct change return to the customer by switching over different states. So to characterize a deterministic finite automata, we need to specify the symbols used, which means alphabets, and all the possible states. And to recognize the strings, we need to know the initial states, where do we start with, and the final states, where the process draws to an end. And of course, the middle transitions from state to state. Here is another illustration of the implementation of such designs. A DFA has an input date a finite control and a reading hand. At the beginning, the reading hand is at the leftmost block and the finite control is at Q0, the initial state. After reading a symbol in the input tape, the reading hand moves one block to the right and the finite control will move to a new state, which is deterministically dependent on the current state and current input symbol. After reading all the symbols of the string, if the finite control is in the finite final state, which is Q4 here, the input string is considered accepted. Otherwise, the input string is not accepted. The only difference of a non-deterministic finite automata and a deterministic finite automata is that NFA allows direct transition between states without reading anything. So empty symbol in a configuration also works. After introducing the the deterministic finite automata and the non-deterministic finite automata, the equivalence of the FA and FA and regular expressions will be shown. Any regular language will be accepted by some deterministic finite automata as well as some non-deterministic finite automata. And it is possible to construct a deterministic finite automaton accepting the same language as a given non-deterministic finite automaton and vice versa. And it is closed under concatenation, union, clean star, and reverse. Also, by properly constructing the FA, it can be shown that regular language is closed under complementation and intersection. 
This is quite different from Kantian's free language introduced later. To prove a language not regular, apart from transforming the language into another one by the closure property, there is also a sophisticated approach using the pumping theorem. It says that for every string of an arbitrary infinite regular language, there must be some repetitive patterns that correspond to a clean star in regular expression or a cycle in a state diagram. And so a certain special length of strings can be pumped and the resulting states string will always be in language. This is proved by applying the pigeonhole principle to the deterministic finite automata representation of the regular language. A context-free language refers to a language that can be generated by a context-free grammar. Here at least four things that we care most about context-free language. The grammar itself, the equivalence of CFL and PA, the closure properties, and the context-free language version pumping theory. I won't give you a clear definition of context-free language here because it is a little complicated with an elegant design of language generator from simple rules. And the process of string generation can be represented by a sparse tree. Context-free grammar fits in expressions like a powers n, b powers n, which cannot be represented by regular expressions. And context-free language is actually a superset of regular language. It is equivalent to languages that can be accepted by pushdown automata. And it is closed under union, concatenation, and clean star operations. The pushdown automata extend the FA by adding a stack to the finite control. So to define a pushdown automata, we also need to know the all possible states, the initial and final states, and transitions. Here, the transitions are merely relations, not functions. And therefore, it's actually non-deterministic. The combination of the triplet and tuple indicates that in this transition, the machine reads in the symbol B, pops out A at the head of the stack, switch to the state Q1 from Q5, and push the symbol B into the state. So here in the illustration, after the transition, the machine looks like this. As mentioned before, what PA accepts is a context-free language, and we can always construct a PA for a context-free language. As shown in the state diagram, the PA accepts strings that looks like A, B, C, B, A, which is impossible for the DFA. And PA is indeed a more powerful model than DFA. As a spoiler, after part one, we are getting to know the powerful Turing machine, which is an extension of FA and PA, but a more general framework for describing arbitrary everything. So why do we still care about the FA or PA? The reason is that they provide fine warm-up exercises in the quest for a Turing machine, a formal general definition of an algorithm. By looking into the addition or removal of different features, we can see how the power of these computational machines waxes and wanes. In addition, they're not just conceptual, but useful and highly optimized components of circuits and compilers in practice. For instance, the lexical analysis stage of a compiler where program units such as operations and blocks are identified is often based on the simulation of a deterministic finite automata. The DFA and PA also have a CPU, central computing unit of fixed finite capacity, like a real computer. All in all, having knowledge of FA and PA helps us to cope with this device better in the future. Apart from the definition of the terms, the most critical message of regular language, deterministic finite automata, context-free language, and push automata that we should be aware of is the equivalence of regular language and DFA, and the equivalence of context-free language and the push automata, and the closure properties for regular language and the context-free language. For regular language, they are closed under concatenation, union, clean star, complementation, and intersection. And for context-free language, they are closed under union, concatenation, and clean star operations. To prove a language not regular or context-free, you may refer to the pumping theory in addition to the closure properties. The important skills to master is to apply the innate properties of the models and languages for real problems. First, for regular languages, write regular expressions and design finite automata, and write the deterministic finite automaton for random non-deterministic finite automaton. Given a context-free grammar, construct a PDA that accepts the language generated by the given grammar. Given a non-deterministic finite automaton, convert it to a deterministic finite automaton. And finally, apply a language that is not regular or nor context-free by using the pumping theorem or closure property properly. That's it.
all for today. Thank you.